is burnt out. Moses is breaking down in despair. He's had it. He's tired of these endless complaints. He says, I'm not able to carry all this people alone for they are too heavy a burden for me. And the Lord, God, offers a solution. He says, Moses, you've got to learn to delegate. <coughs> well, sort of, he said that. That's basically the effect. God says to Moses, gather the 70 leading elders, select and gather 70 elders of Israel, and get them in the tent of meeting, the holy tent of meeting, where they worshiped. Get them there. And I will come down and talk with you there, and I will take some of the spirit that's on you, Moses, and will parcel it out upon these 70 elders so that you will not bear the burden by yourself. Okay, so far so good. The Lord descends in a mysterious cloud and talks with Moses and the elders, and then the Lord parcels out the Spirit among the 70 elders, and Numbers tells us each of the elders begins to prophesy. And what exactly that means, we're not 100% sure, but it's probably some sort of ecstatic religious experience and certainly, to be a prophet means to be God's mouthpiece. So the burden of communicating the things of God is spread about, delegated. Not just Moses, but the 70 elders as well. Only one problem. A couple guys, Eldad and Medad, the lazy bums, were back there in the camp. And so when the spirit fell in the holy tent of meeting, where it's supposed to fall, for God's sake. These two guys, these lazy lunks, are back there in the camp. But when the Spirit falls, it falls not just upon, you know, the, the gathered righteous people in the holy place. It gathers upon, you know, it falls upon these two lazy bums, Eldad and Medad, that are back in the camp. And they begin to prophesy as well. And a young man finds out about this, and he goes running to Joshua, second in command after Moses, running to Joshua, and he, he complains about, about what's happening. I mean, I mean, after all, this is not the way it's done. You need some quality control here. You can't have some freelance prophets running around prophesying all over the place without accountability. We need certification. We need licensing. We need, you know, security, num uh, social security. We need W-2. We need, you know, we, we, we probably need those shirts with the company logo. We need to control this situation. But Moses will have nothing of it. Moses says, are you jealous for my sake, Joshua? Would that all the Lord's Spirit were to fall on all the people. Would that all the people were prophets. Moses is trying to tell us something very important here. Something about the Spirit of God. There's no controlling the Spirit. You can't fence in the Spirit it blasts out of our boundaries. The Spirit of God flows wild and free. Think about Jesus talking to the Pharisee Nicodemus. He says to Nicodemus, the wind blows where it chooses and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. The Spirit is wild and free. Or on another occasion, you heard about it in our scripture readings this morning. The disciples said, they, they, they were complaining about, about somebody they saw. They said, teacher, teacher, we saw someone casting out demons and healing in your name, and we tried to stop them because they don't follow with us. Remember what Jesus did? He rebuked them. He rebuked them. This has implications. We Presbyterians are famous 
for control, are famous for seeing things done decently and in order. And, you know, so we have our democracy and, and uh, the congregation elects a session which runs the church, and then there's the presbytery, and then there's the synod, and then there's the general assembly, you know, and we do everything by vote and by discussion, and we follow Robert's rules of order, and we have a low tolerance for disorder and are high on control. We especially don't like surprises, do we? Yet surprises and even a little bit of confusion, it seems, are the Holy Spirit's stock in trade. The Spirit of God blasts apart our boundaries, dashes our delusions of control, and makes all things new. What would it be like if we, the church, were less about control and more about permission giving. Oh, you feel called to that particular ministry and obviously you're, you're gifted, you're talented? Run with it. Go. What if we, the people in the church, were less about control and more about permission giving? What if the church were less about ego and turf wars and petty jealousies and more about service according to giftedness? What if the church were less about, you know, us versus them and more about we're all in it together? What if the church were less about what makes me happy or what makes you happy as an individual and more about what serves the greater good? A church like this is primed, is primed for the Holy Spirit to explode in our midst. Well, I'll end. I'll end with something that was written long ago by a guy named Ignatius of Latakia. He wrote, Without the Holy Spirit, God is far away. Christ stays in the past. The gospel is a dead book. The church is simply an organization. Authority, a matter of domination. Mission, a matter of propaganda. Worship, no more than a reminder of the past. And Christian living, a slave morality. But with the Spirit, with the Holy Spirit, God is with us. The universe is resurrected and groans with the birth pangs of the kingdom. The risen Christ is here. The gospel is the power of life. The church is the organism, the body of the living Christ. Authority is service. Mission is Pentecost. Worship is both memorial and anticipation. And human action is God at work in the world. Blast away, Holy Spirit. <laughs>